Courtney Nelson, President-elect of City Club of Portland. Thanks for joining us today in the Sentinel Hotel. This is our second Friday Forum in City Club's centennial year. For 100 years, City Club has been and continues to be where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. Please join me in wishing City Club a very happy 100th birthday. <laughs> Members and guests are gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening or watching on OPB Radio, Portland Community Media, or YouTube. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine, and our current Friday Forum sponsors are The Standard, Bank of the Cascades, Stoll Reeves LLP, Family Care, and Russell Fellow Properties. This week's special program sponsors are Intel, Concordia University, and App Nexus. Please join me in showing our appreciation for all of their support. Please join us for our next Friday Forum on January 2nd called Bra, an honest conversation with Sheila Hamilton, Storm Large, and Dr. Chris Ferentinos. These three women have one common thread that's hard to see and even harder to talk about, mental illness and its impact on family members. Sheila Hamilton, Kink FM host and author of All the Things We Never Know, and Storm Large, singer and author of Crazy Enough, will be available for book signing after the forum. If you have a copy of either book, please feel free to bring it to get an autograph. You can learn more about this, these City Club events, purchase tickets, or become a member at pdxcityclub.org. And now for today's program. One year ago, Intel executives pledged $300 million to attract more women and people of color, aiming for complete employment parity by 2020. Intel's not alone. TechTown, a collaboration of Portland tech leaders, pledged last September to add more diversity to their workforces also. For nearly two years, the City of Portland and Multnomah County Library brought together a coalition of community partners to work to eliminate digital access and adoption gaps in our community. Here to help guide today's conversation is Malia Spencer of the Portland Business Journal. As a former City Hall reporter for the Santa Maria Times, now covering local tech, startups, and funding, Malia brings a unique perspective to the topics of digital inclusion and tech equity. Prior to Portland, she was the manufacturing and technology reporter for the Pittsburgh Business Times and holds a master's degree in journalism from the Medal School of Journalism at Northwestern University. Joining Malia on stage, Sam Blackman, CEO and co-founder of Elemental Technologies, Pat McDonald, Vice President of Human Resources and Director of, In of the Intel Talent Organization at Intel Corporation, and Dwayne Johnson, Partner at Scale Up Partners. Later in today's program, we'll also hear from Valley Elke, Director of the Multnomah, Multnomah County Library District. Please join me in welcoming today's guests. Thank you for that, and happy birthday to the City Club. Uh, for those of us, or for those uh, tuning in on OPB, you're listening to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Malia Spencer of the Portland Business Journal, and I'm here with Dwayne Johnson, Pat McDonald, and Sam Blackman, and we're talking about digital inclusion and tech equity here in Portland. So. I wanted to sort of start this conversation off with um, some groundwork of some uh, stats that I found on the TechTown website, uh, which is compiled by PDC data. Uh, so first off, just looking at gender, for Portland, the general population is 49% male and 51% female. Makes sense. Uh, but the overall workforce is 52% male and 48% female. 
but then when you look at the tech industry, it swings. It goes 67% male and 33% female. And when you look at ethnicity and race, it gets even worse. So uh, we're looking at an industry that within a white city is still disproportionately white. Um, the overall population of Portland is 75% white, 12% Latino, 3% black, 6% Hispanic, and the remaining 5% fall into the other category. But the tech industry, if you look at it, is 84% white, 4% Latino, 2% black, 9% Asian, and 2% into the other. So I just kind of wanted to throw those out there so we're all kind of on the same page on that. And so with that, I wanted to sort of start the discussion with uh, Sam and Pat, just talking about, you know, within your organizations, you know, what are you doing to address diversity within your workforces. Um, I know Elemental has been vocal about this and Intel has been making headlines with its $300 million uh, initiative around diversity. So I wanted to start with Pat, since you have the, the big money. Um, Pat, you're in charge of Intel's talent organization and your CEO, Brian Krasanich, has been out front and very vocal talking about diversity within the company. And so looking at those initiatives that you've started over the past year or so, you know, what are the one or two that have you the most excited in terms of, of kind of the outcomes and what you see moving forward? Well, the thing I'm most excited about, and before I start, I wanted to say happy 100th birthday to the City Club of Portland. And what I'm most excited about is that we've made a big investment. We have been working on creating a more diverse and inclusive workforce for 15 years, but we really view 2015, and when Brian Krasanich, our CEO, took the stage at the Consumer Electronics Show and declared to the world that by 2020, we would reach full representation at every level as our breakthrough moment. And since then, you know, there is nothing like being in an audience and getting your next five years of your career laid out in front of you. It's very clear what the goal is as the um, leading the talent organization was to really put together a very systemic um, program. So things I'm excited about is the fact that we are changing the game in hiring. We're changing the game in the way we invest with our supplier base and who we invest with in terms of Intel Venture Capital. And most importantly, we're continuing our legacy of investing in STEM initiatives starting from the middle schools through high school and beyond. I'm curious, why was 2015 sort of that change year? Any insight into why, why 2015 to make this, this move? Um, our overall goal as a company is to transform ourselves from just being known as a chip company to being known as a product company. And if you're going to transform yourselves in terms of the products you deliver, you have to look around. And if you're starting to sell to consumers, you have to think about what is that demographic. The demographics of the folks that we want to sell to and provide technology and all the benefits that come with are the demographics that you just quoted. So we need to um, produce products and we in need to start those product decisions with people who reflect our consumer base and the communities that we serve. So, Sam, you are part of, you're leading one of the high profile, fast growing companies in town. Um, you've been very vocal about uh, the Tech Town initiative and Elemental has become pretty self-reflective, I think, on the whole diversity issue within your workforce. And so I know you've brought in some training for your employees and I'm wondering, you know, what progress have you made and, you know, what are you hoping to, to work on continuing? Uh, it's um, a great question, and I want to start with what Pat just ended with, which is that it's really critical when you're talking about these issues to frame them in the business context in which we live. We're running businesses. We need to do what's right for the business. And as Pat said, when you're designing products 
that are for a global audience and a global set of consumers, in our case, a global set of people that run video operations for large media companies, you have to design your software, you have to design your product in a way that anyone can access and leverage it effectively. So diversity is a, an inclusion work. It's really important from an ethical and moral standpoint, but it's also absolutely critical from a business standpoint. And I constantly go back to that refrain when I'm talking to people about why Elemental is investing time, investing energy in these initiatives. So I think that's an important thing that we always talk about with this issue. Obviously, we have huge, embarrassing gaps in women in minorities that participate in our industry. We need to solve that for a lot of community reasons, but it's the right thing for the business as well. So the Tech Town initiative that Elemental was proud to take a leadership role in last year was a fascinating process for me. Elemental, for those who don't know, it's about a nine-year-old startup now. We were in early 2015, about 200 employees. So we were getting to that critical mass where we had the time and resources to be able to think about more broad issues than just our core business, our core product. And so we really kicked off this diversity initiative with PDC, the Poland Development Commission's leadership. And we went through and identified five key things that we wanted to do better. It included identifying minorities and helping them move into the organization, internal training programs, which Malia alluded to, reporting the numbers. I think that is such an important aspect of this, is actually quantitatively defining where we are today and where we want to get to. Your intro leveraged the numbers from the TechTown website. And it seems like obvious, easy things to do, but getting technology companies in Portland to participate with us in this initiative, it was like pulling teeth. We ended up having 12 companies that participated with us at the beginning, but that reporting aspect, that self-reporting of what your makeup is today, that's a terrifying topic for a lot of technology companies and helping them recognize that, hey, we understand there's a problem today, we understand we need to do better, but if we don't have a baseline to start from, we're not gonna be able to show improvement or have goals to drive to, was a critical aspect. And getting the 12 companies that participated to, to do so, and now that number is 25 and continue, continuing to grow, that is gonna show the progress we're making. Now in terms of specific progress that Elemental is making, we've only done the first survey last June. We'll do another survey here in the next couple of months. I think we're gonna see some progress. It's gonna be slow. And that's the other thing I like to do is set expectations. There's a lack of supply to some degree in terms of how many women are graduating from universities, how many minorities are graduating with the right degrees that we're hiring for. And so this is not something that's gonna be transformative overnight, but I am convinced that by working together, by educating people on the opportunity in technology, we'll get more and more folks over the next couple of years. And so making this a sustained effort not just one big announcement last year, but something that we're talking about and working on year after year after year, that's how we'll accomplish the change that we need to have to be a competitive company in the global economy. I'm curious, you said that it was difficult to get companies to, to sign on to the initial tech town with you. Why was that and how did you get them to finally sign on? Say one more, I couldn't and quite. Why, why was it so difficult to get those companies involved with you in tech town initially? And how did you finally convince them? We didn't convince all of them. We only had 12 companies. There's about 500 great technology companies in a 10 mile radius of Elemental Headquarters these days. Um, I think the challenge is this issue is one where the numbers are terrible. When you publish your numbers, there's a lot of people that say, you guys are a terrible industry. You're not doing a good job in diversity. You don't have enough women. You should be embarrassed. And frankly, I think a lot of us are, and we want to do better. Kind of putting yourself out to public ridicule like that is a little bit of a, a scary thing for a company to do. And that's why a lot of companies have taken a long time, I think, to, to choose to do so. But it's the only way that you make progress on the issue. And I think by putting those numbers out there and being honest about the problem and talking about it, you have a chance to solve it. If you keep hiding it beneath the covers, if you don't disclose, you're never gonna solve it. It's not gonna become something that you can track. And that's why we did that. And so, Dwayne, I wanted to bring you into this as well. So you've been involved with uh, tech and diversity and entrepreneurship in this uh, region here for 30 years. And I just wanted to get your take on sort of the discussion that's happening now. And um, maybe specifically one thing that Sam said in that it's not gonna happen overnight. And I just kind of wanted to, to get your thoughts on that whole timing issue. 
Well, thank you, Millie, and happy birthday. Happy 100th birthday. That's like a long time. Um, well, I look at it this way. At the end of the day, it's really about time that this conversation really came out in the public. And it's one of the things I really think is great about Portland is that it's really willing to have this conversation because as a person that's been in tech for literally 30 years, um, I can't tell you how many times I've been the only in the room. And it's hard. It's hard when you don't feel that you have support from other folks. But here's the challenge. I've also sat on the other side of the, the table where I've been the person running the company. And when you're trying to keep the company in business and growing, you're typically focused on that bottom line, what you need today. So to be able to step back and say, well, you know what? I need to actually add this inclusion piece to it and continue to do all the other things that I'm doing. That's really, really hard. And let's be honest, we don't like to, we don't like to fail. And especially when we're up in the C-suite, we really don't like failure. So being able to get past that, you know what? We're gonna fail in some places here and we're gonna get back up and try to keep this ball moving forward has been really hard. So I think one of the biggest things that has changed over the last 30 years is that people are actually willing to get up and do this work. So it may not be as public. You know, one of the things I actually work with a number of folks who are in Intel, and they do a lot in this community that most people never see. But they're in the game, and I applaud them for that. So when Sam brings folks together and says we're gonna have 10 companies, 12 companies, 15 companies, it's a start. And for me, that next step is, okay, now that you've got folks that are willing to talk about it, how do we actually move the ball forward? So I'm willing to have a conversation with anybody around this, whether it be in the technology field or the, you know, pretty much the rest of the community as well. I get that there are particular issues in tech that make this a little harder. And I mean, I'll talk a little bit about it. What are those issues that make it harder? We'll call them um, the, the meritocracy. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, we like to think of ourselves as being relatively smart and exhibiting that is very typical in tech. So it's almost like that whole smartest person in the room conversation and that that conversation typically wins out. Well, that's a typically very male conversation, let's be honest. So when, Pope, when you're in a room full of folks and it's about how fast you can think, how quickly you can think, how loud you can express your opinion, and then basically dominate that, that conversation, it doesn't leave a lot of space for people that do things differently. And this is where that whole diversity and inclusion conversation comes in because there are people that have very, very different ways of interacting and being. So the trick is to create that safe space where those conversations really can happen, those interactions can happen. And that's where those diverse ideas come from. And I think that we're seeing more of that now than I think we saw in the past. I was gonna say for uh, Pat and Sam, do you, either of you have any comment on that whole meritocracy idea? I mean, it, it's in all the tech blogs all the time about this myth of the meritocracy and, and, and being part of the problem here. I just wasn't sure if any, either of you had any uh, insight into whether or not it's still there or are people finally starting to, to acknowledge it? I think I'm part of the problem on that particular. <laughs> I mean, the way a early stage entrepreneur is successful, if they are, and the odds are really low, is they project a lot of confidence. They go out and talk to investors and customers and they convince them that they know what they're doing. When, you know, Sometimes they do, many times they don't. Many times they think they do, many times they don't. And so, as a CEO, I can say, you know, I went from being an engineer at a, a great company here in Portland, Pixelworks, to starting a company with two colleagues, and then our founding CEO quit, and I said, okay, I'll be the CEO because I'm the worst software engineer. We were changing from hardware design to software design, and I was a hardware designer. So I said, all right, I'll be CEO. You guys focus on software. I'll, I'll help with software as I can. I had no business being a CEO, right? I mean, you go talk to an investor, you go talk to a customer, and you have to convince them that you have business being a CEO when you really don't. And I think that probably leads to companies 
having that kind of leadership in place for a long time, and it's hard to change and evolve the culture to one where there's more space for everyone else. I, I got it, Dwayne, when you were making your content, your, your comment, I looked over at the elemental table here, and there was some very knowing smiles and nods, so I'm culpable. For okay. sure. I have to interrupt for a second here. So uh, for those of you just tuning in on OPB, you're listening to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I am Malia Spencer of the Portland Business Journal, and I'm here with Dwayne Johnson, Pat McDonald, Sam Blackman, and we are being joined by Bailey Elke. We're talking about digital inclusion and tech equity here in Portland. And so uh, we have obviously tech leaders here, and we've been talking about tech diversity within tech companies, but we also have a number of people here from the Multnomah County Library District and people who are involved with the public efforts to address the issue of digital inclusion. And so we have Bailey Elke, who's the Director of Libraries, to talk about some of the work that the county is doing. So, Bailey. Thank you, and happy birthday, City Club. You know, the library, <clears throat> excuse me, just turned 150 a couple of years ago, so welcome to the Centenarian Club. So imagine applying for a job or college and finding you have to complete an 18-page online application in order to do so. However, you have no personal computer, no high-speed internet access, or you have only a smartphone. Imagine trying to draft a resume on a smartphone. Most of us live our daily lives with a smartphone in hand, a tablet or laptop in our briefcase, and a computer at home or work. We expect high-speed internet access, and we depend on it. Yet thousands of people in our community live on the other side of the digital divide. No internet, no devices, and no way to get the needed resources to cross that divide. They are effectively excluded from job opportunities, education, and civic participation. Unless we take action to bridge this divide, we will all bear the costs. A less competitive and innovative workforce, diminished civic participation, and a large segment of our community marginalized and isolated, and I know that's not what we want. But together, we can strengthen our community, our workforce, and our economy by focusing on three areas of action. Affordable access to quality broadband access, low-cost devices, and access to personal training that helps you learn to use that access in a productive way. So digital inclusion, which is removing barriers to all three of those areas, is very closely tied to the health and vitality of our region. Alongside things like educational outcomes, economic vitality, social and civic participation, income equality, and affordable housing. This issue, though, doesn't end at Portland's city limits. As new buildings gleam in inner Portland, more and more people are displaced to lower cost housing east of 82nd Avenue. We all know that. Addressing our digital divide will require cooperation across political jurisdictions and the private sector, including the county, the library district, cities, school districts, employers, community organizations, and residents. I'm here because libraries have a really big stake in digital inclusion. You might know that libraries help people uh, complete resumes and job applications, but did you know you can check out a person who will help you do this? One of them that's here with us today is one of our employees, Carlos Galliana. Carlos is over there. Um, Carlos is our bilingual Spanish East County Regional Technology Coordinator. I'm glad that's not my job title, Carlos. <laughs> Carlos can help you learn Google Docs or load free audiobooks on your Kindle. He can help your parents learn about security software or how to use Facebook. I'm not sure that's a good or a bad thing. Um, Multnomah County Library is by far the largest provider of free broadband access in our area. Last year, patrons used nearly one million computer sessions and another million Wi-Fi sessions in our libraries. We're breaking new ground literally to advance digital inclusion right now Crews are finalizing construction of a maker space at our Rockwood branch that's bringing cutting edge technology and personal instruction and importantly mentors to young people, especially girls, in uh, things like coding, 
circuit building, and 3D printing. This is possible by a grant from the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission and funds raised by the Library Foundation. I want to quickly get to the effort that was um, alluded to earlier. There is a group of organizations in this community um, called the Digital Inclusion Network, and they're working on a digital equity action plan. You'll hear, be hearing more about it in the spring. But some of the things that this group is going to propose will include things like ensuring high-speed internet access and devices um, are, are affordable, enacting public policies that apply a digital equity lens to decision-making, dedicating a small portion of affordable housing funds to digital inclusion in new projects, creating digital literacy curricula that's easy to get to and use, and providing resources for digital equity-focused grants. So what's next? This is where the rubber hits the road. These solutions require action and investment from a wide range of stakeholders. Today I'm asking all of us, public agencies, businesses, elected leaders, educators, and community members to commit to making sure that everyone in our community has access to low-cost, quality broadband devices and training. And we should have a meaningful conversation about our current model of broadband scarcity. In the U.S., nearly four in five households have only one option for broadband access. I need to wrap up my remarks. If you want to hear more about this, please contact me at the library. Thank you. Awesome. So, thanks, Bailey, for that. And now that you're up here, I wanted to see, could you maybe explain a little bit more sort of that solid line between digital inclusion and the tech diversity issue that we've been talking about. You know, why should we be having these two conversations at the same time? Absolutely, it is, it is a solid line. So we heard from uh, Sam and Duane about the issue of a pipeline and getting the kinds of folks they need in their um, industry especially from diverse backgrounds. And digital inclusion is all about targeting folks with the fewest resources to ensure that they have the same degree of access, the training they need, the equipment and the devices they need to be successful. So if you want a richer and more diverse pipeline, a digital inclusion effort is really important in creating that. Okay, I did, Sam or Pat, do either of you have a, uh, want to chime in on this idea of kind of bringing those two uh, conversations into one at this point? Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So, yeah, the earlier and the sooner we can get people access to digital devices, the earlier and sooner they can get access to information and educational programs. And education is the intervention, and technology is the vehicle. And so I'm absolutely in support of it. Intel is a long, long-time investor in getting our technology out amongst all kinds of diverse communities and making it a more inclusive community event. Okay, either Sam or Dwayne. You have a... Thank you. I would say that the digital inclusion is an economic imperative. Um, for those of you that follow what's happening in the tech world and are looking at the internet of things, it's going to revolutionize the way we live in ways that are even beyond what happened with the internet. And the less you know about this, the worse off you're going to be. So think about what opportunities are available for folks that understand what the digital world is, what the transformations around work are going to look like. The fact that you may be able to have technology that does some of the same work that you go to work to do right now working for you as opposed to working for your employer. What does the future of work looks like in this, in this environment we're talking about? These are all things that are very, very important. When it gets down to, to access, I think that in the next five years, I think the access is going to change. Some of it's going to be driven by the very companies that you're already working with, but in different ways. So I'll give you an example. If the power company and the gas company want to be able to collect information at your house, and it took having broadband in your house to do that, they'd put it in if there was an economic imperative for that. So we think about what the opportunities are of extending um, technology and broadband and connectivity out in ways that um, right now don't make economic sense. 
but in a future where everything is interconnected and interrelated, those lines will need to be there to take advantage of those, those opportunities. So getting a little ahead of that curve and being able to have people that are able to take advantage of and understand what those technology transformations and how to take advantage of them are gonna be really important. Bailey, are you seeing any companies work with you at this point? I mean, what, what's kind of the, um, the interface at that, at that level? Uh, so I mentioned briefly our Rockwood maker space that is about to launch in just a couple of months, um, it's very quickly. Um, we've been very fortunate to have partners in the community like Pixel Arts, who have brought folks from that organization to um, teach kids how to do video design and more importantly serve as mentors from the industry and learning with those kids and creating with those kids, which is a really important part about that relationship. And, and we'll continue those kinds of relationships. And if anyone out there is interested in providing us with mentors, we're happy to talk with you and would love to hear from you. Okay. Sam, I think you were gonna... I just, the, <clears throat> the pipeline help that you can provide with this work and this initiative is, is so critical. I don't think people probably are aware of how bad the numbers are, but in the last couple of years, the number of women graduates in computer science was about 12%. So of all the, the computer science graduates in the United, United States, only 12% were women. In 1985, that number was 37%. So we've gone from roughly four in 10 computer science graduates being women to one. And so that makes the initiatives that companies like Elemental and Intel and others are taking extremely difficult because the talent pool that's out there that we can recruit from is extremely small, which is why we're doing a lot of work with high schools like Rosemary Anderson and Benson and, and Roosevelt and others because if the, the kids that are here aren't going to college and studying computer science, it's a lot harder for us to hire you. And that's a key part of it is starting early and getting them interested in science engineering in the beginning. And with your work, Dwayne, are you seeing uh, the digital inclusion discussion incorporate with like the companies that you might be working with or the various meetings that you're having? Well, well yes, the answer is yes to that. And uh, it's interesting because many of the companies we talk to look very differently at digital inclusion and education in that we've entered an age where there's a lot that's online and accessible and available to um, folks that want to take advantage of it. And, and I'll give a little personal story here about the difference between, you know, 30 years ago and now. So when I graduated from high school, I knew 22 different programming languages. Now half of them were assembly languages, which are things most of you would never want to look at, trust me. Um, but over that 30 years, the, the application of that technology has gotten a lot easier and a lot easier for understanding. And it's great to see now where, you know, with Innovate Oregon, we're seeing junior high school kids and high school kids not only grasping this work, but excelling with it. So they'll write their own applications. They'll write their own programs that, you know, can work on their phone, your tablet, or a computer, and don't think anything of it. So. I think that there's a part in our education system where we may want to up our game. And when we talk about what's possible for companies, being able to take a look at a broader population of people who have digital and technology skills already that just may need to be polished a little bit to be able to work in the um, business world. So, and I, I think you, you, the two of you should share your internship story because you both have a, a common thread there. So maybe one of you want to share that. So it turned out that um, we have a similar internship story. Um, we both worked in one of our fabs, Fab Four and in Intel, and we discovered that when we t um, talked to each other. So I started, how I got started in um, technology and semiconductors was I, I was a college intern in one of our factories, Fab Four. So I. Um, loved the pulse of technology. I loved being out on the factory floor, being a technician, and it was the first time I ever really saw what I was learning in school, all that chemical engineering actually being applied to make something. I was just fascinated by the intersection of the science and technology. And that, that propelled me to um, later, I became a manager of one of those plants. 
and that really started my career. So it was, you know, that break that I got with becoming the summer intern that really um, launched my career path in semiconductors. And Sam has a similar story. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh, Intel had a program when I graduated from high school in 1994 where they hired a few Oregon high school students to be interns in their fabs. And I'll tell you to the high school kids here, if you can get an internship at Intel, it is the best internship ever. I played volleyball and basketball like three times a day. And I, w I was working in the fab, so I had to wear a bunny suit. You've probably seen the commercials for the bunny suits. So, you know, this is the summer break in, in Oregon, nice weather here in the summer. I would have a three hour shift. I would go take the bunny suit off. I'd play basketball super hard for an hour, get totally sweaty put the bunny suit back on. No one knew that you're like just pouring sweat in the fab. That's like the worst thing you can do in a fab because it destroys chips when they get water so and things on them. Any but it was, it was an incredible of, yeah. internship. And you know, I, I really didn't know a thing about technology. My family didn't get a computer until very late just because my mother thought they were evil. Sam, um, I gotta cut you off there because I, okay, I gotta talk to the radio audience. Uh, so for those of you tuning in on OPB, you're listening to uh, the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Malia Spencer with the Portland Business Journal. I'm here with Dwayne Johnson, Pat McDonald, and Sam Blackman, and Vailey Elke, and we're talking about digital inclusion and tech equity here in Portland. And so, Vailey, I know you have uh, a lot of patrons that are, that are using uh, this, uh, these new programs, and so I wanted, I think you've got somebody that you can introduce, introduce us to? Yeah, if, you know, we believe stories are really powerful, and we thought we'd make it real in terms of what the library does around digital inclusion, so we've invited one of our library patrons, Kathleen Nelson, who's here in the audience, to just briefly share with you her experience around the sorts of things that the library's provided her. Good afternoon. I'm here to express profuse thanks to the library system for helping me with their one-on-one -on -one computer tutoring resource. Um, I had a professional level employment for many years and then I was out of the workforce for 15 years and had to get back in and because of my lengthy absence and being so far behind with computers, I took an entry level position and stayed stuck there for a long time. I went looking for all kinds of low cost or no cost computer resources and um, there's a huge gap out there. I finally had the good fortune of connecting with the library system, and after working once a week with Carlos, who's already been introduced today, I received a significant promotion at work, and I am also now a very enthusiastic volunteer for the library system, assisting Carlos teaching other beginners. So um, I just want to show you guys a live person who's living proof that, that it's a fantastic program, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we've heard how digital inclusion fits into the pipeline for diversity and the tech workforce, but we also have uh, somebody else here, I believe, that uh, Nitin Rai, who's president of uh, Thai Oregon, uh, who could, who's been doing a lot of work um, in with the state's entrepreneurs, but then also with a new subset of entrepreneurs. And so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your Thai Youth Entrepreneurs Program? Sure, so uh, TYE is Thai Youth Entrepreneurs. We launched that a year ago. And uh, in the last 12 months, we have uh, coached um, about 140 kids, high school kids, on lean entrepreneurship methodology. And you know we've got a variety of competitions and programs. What I'm most proud of is uh, our program, which was got some funding from Lemelson Foundation uh, to actually launch it in school uh, at Benson High School, uh, where we're coaching about uh, 17 kids who are below par. So these kids were, were failing. And the outcome is unbelievable. Um, so as far as, uh, you know, um, intentional uh, investment, that intentional investment is already paying off within, within four to six weeks. These kids are actually responding when they weren't responding to other classes. Uh, so we, we hope to take this program you know, uh, statewide and uh, with this intention that we're gonna help kids, uh, not only the, the um, privileged kids on the west side of, uh, of town, but also on the east side, where I think there's a really, really big opportunity. Um, around that, actually, I wanted to ask a question. 
Um, I also am a recipient of, you know, I'm a brown guy, Indian American, and we're not really considered minority anymore. <laughs> Um, but we all came to this country with nothing, and uh, you know, education is what, what helped us, but we had to fight the same battles. But um, I, got, um, I started a fund, unintentionally, uh, called uh, Elevate Capital, uh, which just received uh, support from the city of Portland, the state, and Multnomah County of 1.25 million to invest in minorities in the greater Portland area, including women. Uh, it was an intentional investment. I was also intentionally supported by two nameless individuals, I can't name them right now, but an African-American lady and a Japanese-American gentleman who have encouraged me to, to do this. Uh, my question to you, Pat, and, um, uh, and uh, Sam is, um, what, what are your thoughts and what are Intel's plans and perhaps your plans, Sam, now that you've exited as an entrepreneur, in terms of making intentional investments in this sort of community in the greater Portland area? So we do have our broad base. Um, we do have a very intentional program as part of the overall, our overall um, systemic focus, and that is to, over the next five years, invest 125 million in venture capitalists, venture capital firms run by women and underrepresented minorities. And I can connect you with the person um, who's responsible for making those, doing the exploration and making the selection. I'd be glad to do that. It, it's a great question, Nitin. Um, it's early days for Elemental as a part of Amazon Web Services, uh, the big company that sells things that you order online, if you're not familiar with Amazon. Um, you know, Elemental's approach this in a lot of different ways. One of the big initiatives we've had over the past couple of years is something called the 4K for Charity Run. We've had it at several different trade shows. Last year we had the first one in Portland and supported the Rosemary Anderson High School. And by working with a lot of the other tech town diversity companies, we're able to raise $56,000 for Rosemary Anderson. And almost more importantly, thank you. That kid right there, Samuel Nagasi, who's sitting at the table, I'm glad to see you today, Sam, I haven't seen you since the 4K. It, Rosemary Anderson sent 120 kids and teachers from their, their school to join the 600, 700 technology people who are participating in this run, and so there were connections formed that we didn't have before, and Sam actually came up to me and said, hey, I really love computers, I've loved them from an early age, could I potentially have an internship at Intel? And I said, I have no idea, but send me your information and I will make sure that we figure out if that's a possibility. And so he followed up very well, very nicely written email to me and follow up and connected him to the, the right department in our, our test group that could potentially have a, a high school intern in that role. And I don't know where that's gonna go, but I think if, if Sam follows up on some of the things we sent, he could be a high school intern at Elemental. And with Amazon, we have the resources to have many more than the 10 to 15 that we had in the past. The one other note I'd make quickly is that as an early stage company that's burning venture capital, it's very hard to put in place some of the benefits that make workplaces more inclusive and diverse. And I unfortunately can't claim any credit for this, but we constantly want to do something in more in powerful from a maternity and paternity leave, a parental leave policy. And at Elemental, we just couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford to pay people for a long time to, to not work or work at home with the baby. And a couple of weeks after the acquisition, Amazon announced a new incredible parental leave policy, 20 weeks paid leave for new parents, six shared weeks where you could literally tell Amazon, hey, I want my spouse to get the time off, not me, and Amazon will pay for them to have the time off. And having that kind of workplace where you can be a woman and come in and potentially have a baby and not have it be anything that impacts your career, that's a huge new benefit that we couldn't offer as a standalone company. So I'm hoping to bring many more of those type of efforts to bear at Elemental as a part of Amazon. All right. So I think uh, we're going to the uh, Q&A portion of the program now. So if you have written a question on an index card, you can hold it up and a City Club staff will collect it. 
um, and we'll take questions from the audience. Um, as always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Uh, before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and keep your questions to about 30 seconds. Also, um, I'll read at least one of the index cards. Hi, uh, I'm a civic scholar from David Douglas High School. My name is Kennedy Bertelson. Uh, talking about diversity, I'm curious if you're looking past just women and various ethnicities. Are you going out of your way to hire more trans and other LGBTQ people like you are women and the ethnically diverse? If not, do you have policies in place to protect your LGBTQ employees? So we, uh, we welcome all, so we do have a specifically LGBTQ um, employee resource groups. Uh, we also um, cover the entire spectrum that you mentioned um, through our employee resource groups. I'm proud to say that last year they grew significantly from 15,000 uh, worldwide to 18,000. And we, um, will continue to be very open and we we don't we we have one of our largest and most successful events recently was um, attending the lesbians who tech event and we're using that as one of our pipelines that we're going to continue to tap talent in the future from Hi, my name is Andrew Debigal. I'm a new City Club member. Um, I'm also the creator of Harvest. Um, so I should also point out with, for the OPB radio listeners that in the room we have a visualization up on screen that allows people to capture the, the pulse of the room. So um, I really appreciate the focus on the, on the discussion around pipeline. And, um, and I think based on my initial brushing of the data that's coming in, pipeline seemed to be a big giant um, emotion to this room. And uh, so I wanted to echo one of the comments from Harvest uh, in my question, and, uh, and it, because it, it allows people to also submit comments if you guys wanted to do that. Um, the question here, or more like the statement really, is the issues with the pipeline aren't limited to graduates or programs. Women and people of color are graduating, but the culture of the industry knocks them out early. I was wondering if folks in the panel can, uh, to, can I address that? Retention issue, maybe. So we are equally focused as in our hiring as a, and in our retention efforts. That is part of our um, systemic approach. You are correct, that is as much of a challenge as hiring out of the pipeline. And we specifically are looking um, internally, we're starting with, as we have in the past, with education programs and training for our, all of our managers and leaders around how you actually have career enriching discussions and provide stretch opportunities and stretch assignments to all the members on your teams and in your organization. So we've launched that this year. It is a worldwide global program. So education is one piece. Um, the other piece is that we look across the board at our uh, promotions and we target and deliver on promotions at parity um, year in and year out in our annual performance management program. And as well as that, as we have special initiatives such as um, the one that I lead as the leader of the Intel Network of Executive Women, where each of us as women VPs, we sponsor two protégés, so two up-and-coming women leaders, and we are using that as a role model to also have that done with our other um, leadership councils, the Intel Black Leadership Council and the Intel Hispanic Leadership Council. So we, that is one of our biggest um, investments, is actually having our executives invest in the up and coming leaders. And then we have a women at Intel networking chapters, 40 throughout the world, 5,000 members strong, and they're leading um, what we call pay it forward circles, where they mentor eight additional. And so we're trying to cascade this 
um, outreach of career knowledge and opportunities. Dwayne, did you have something to add? Well, hello. Um, I, I'm, I, I grapple with what you just said because at the end of the day, there have always been quite a few people that had the skills to do this work. And I think the challenge has been, could they get a, a seat at the table? Could they have their voices heard? <laughs> and, you know, whether it's people of color, whether it's women, whether it's, you know, people from different countries or cultures, I think one of the biggest challenges is always about what culture that they, they are stepping into and where does that conversation start and change? In other words, is there a, what I call a truth-telling culture? Can someone say that I'm having a problem or a challenge stepping into this environment and actually be heard? And once you've gotten past that, can we actually have a conversation, then we can talk about what we're gonna do about it. Because you, you know, I have mentors in the past, I've been a mentor in the past, and we have a capacity challenge because once someone knows that you're, you have a particular skill set, you may find yourself with a door full of people that want, that want that support. And at the end of the day, I think many of us can give that level of support if we have a listening for those people. So being able to open the conversation up about, you know what, I'm, I'm not feeling engaged here, I'm not feeling accepted here, or I would like to have opportunities available to me that I'm not seeing, and then having a person maybe stop and say, you know what, you may be right. What can I do about that? And taking the, that personal responsibility and that personal step, not only to work with that person, but to work with others in the executive team and work with others in the industry to change that conversation and, and create that open and safe space for, you know, really for us to have transformation. Hi, my name is Giselle Hedman. I'm a student at Portland State University. Um, I study communications and civic leadership, um, so this is right up my alley. Um, one of the things that I hear you guys talking about is your efforts um, to include people. Um, my question is more addressing the other side of the issue. Um, there are so many people who feel tokenized from these kinds of efforts, and I'm wondering, um, from, from my, my, pers my personal standpoint, um, I study organizational communication, so I study how these issues affect the culture that you guys have created in your organization. So my question is, from an organizational standpoint, where are you taking measures to ensure that people don't feel tokenized from the other side and ensure that their understandings and their perceptions of this experience is enveloped in the way that you guys are creating your diverse programs and your outreach programs? It's a great question, and it's something that you're constantly struggling with, I think, when you work on these type of initiatives. At Elemental, for example, we just had a training this week called an Empathy Lab, and the Empathy Lab was essentially putting you in a position where you either had a, a vision issue or you had a, a touch issue or there was a, a gender difference and essentially putting you in the shoes of someone that has that type of disability or that gender or, or what have you. And it was very interesting, but at the same time, it had to be caveated up front that, hey, just because you're doing an empathy lab doesn't mean you have a clue what it's like to walk in the shoes of this person. And so we kind of had to have this upfront discussion to make sure because you wore these glasses for five minutes doesn't mean you know what it's like to be, you know, a, a certain vision condition. And so at Elemental, we've done our best to put those kind of trainings on and educate the team that way. Um, but you're absolutely right that it is a risk of talking about this and a risk of putting this out here. And as a leader, you kind of have to balance whether the risk of this impacting people a certain way is worth it. And the feedback that I have from Elementals thus far is that they appreciate the efforts and they want to see more of them. And we probably need to do a really good job of talking to people who fit into some of these categories and making sure that they appreciate it the same way that our non-diverse employee population is super excited that we're working on it. So I'm going to absolutely keep that in mind and make sure we continue to do so. Great question. All right. Pro so, Promise King 
City Club member and Executive Director of League of Minority Voters. I have about 10 questions, but I, I'm going to limit it to two. Sorry, I want to take you back to the basics. I have listened, I have listened to <laughs> somebody stopping me here. Um, right back, how, what is your definition of equity? And how, what, what vision of digital inclusion equity would you like to see at the end of the game? What is your definition of equity? And what vision of equity, digital inclusion equity, would you like to see at the end of this conversation? I can start. Um, you know, I think for us it's about um, ensuring that everybody has the same level of opportunities, but also acknowledging that every, not everyone starts from the, the same place. And so, um, really acknowledging and then focusing resources and energy um, in the places where people don't have the opportunities that some of us have had. And at the library, you know, we take very seriously and put a lot of time and energy into serving um, the needs and providing opportunities for new immigrants, people of color, um, folks with the fewest resources, low-income families, recognizing that we have the opportunity to make a difference and have some impact there. At the end of the day, it would be nice to say that everyone has that, starts in that same place, but that's simply not our reality right now. So I've got one of the index cards here. So this person writes, three of the four speakers on stage today are seemingly white. How are they not just growing racial diversity in their workforces, but also creating leadership opportunities for more diverse folks? So moving people up the line. So I thought, Sam, if you got any, any thoughts? Because I know the, the leadership at Elemental is all male and predominantly white. So I'm wondering, along with this question, you know, how do you how do you prepare yourself to, to deal with this issue when it might not be something you've faced yourself? That's a tough question. <laughs> this is the reason We it's... end it with the hard ones. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Malia. Thank you very much. Um, one thing that, you know, when you start a company, you learn a ton of things along the way. And if I was starting a company from scratch again, someday perhaps, I would do it with a diverse team. Because what you start with, that nucleus, and we had three white males that started Elemental, and that means most of the people in our circle were white males, and that means it's easier to hire white males that you know, it's, and then that kind of just transpires and goes on and on and on, and that's the root of the problem here. Um, so we're doing a lot of individual development assessments at Elemental. We're making sure that we don't have unconscious bias. It's not having people be promoted for the wrong reasons. We're focusing a lot on ensuring that we develop careers of women and um, minorities as effectively as we are white males. And it's just, it's a long process. And at Elemental, it's something we didn't get started on in any sustained way until about a year and a half ago, and it's going to take a while for it to bear fruit and make the company look the way we want it to look. So um, I would say my entire job, the formal part of my entire job right now, is dedicated to changing, changing the game, changing those numbers. I mean, I'm responsible to deliver the diverse hiring that it will ensure that we're at full representation by 2020. That's my formal role. Since I've been in college, I've been working with Society of Women Engineers, and as I rose through the ranks, I have had staffs that have easily uh, represented 50% men and 50% women, and that is when I was managing in technology in our manufacturing group, and when I was doing product development work as well. All right, and I think, I think we're out of time. I'm being told we're wrap it up. And unfortunately, we've run out of broadcast time for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful questions and the comments from the panel. Uh, but the conversation's not over. Uh, we'll be continuing at App Nexus for light refreshments from 1.30 to 3 o'clock at 711 Southwest Alder Street, the corner of Alder and Broadway. So I hope you'll join us. Uh, I'm Courtney Nelson, president-elect of City Club. Please join me in thanking our guests today, our wonderful moderator, and KJ Lewis at the Friday Forum.
We're adjourned.